For a long time after Lucy's closed, Nashville was still a small town. Back in the day, you couldn't help but run into people you knew at the grocery store or the movies. So for the last 25 years or so, I would occasionally run into the kids who were part of the Lucy's community. In January 2021, my job ended and I stopped traveling around the state and I got to spend more time in the city I live in. Nashville is no longer a small town, so it seemed kind of strange to me that by the summer of 2021, the chance meetings with Lucy's kids began to really ramp up. Again, it was probably because I was off the hamster wheel, but the frequency of the chance encounters really got my attention, and so did their stories. It was the sudden increase of these chance encounters that gave me the idea for this podcast. Chance encounters, coincidences, synchronicity, whatever you want to call it, they're special, or they're not. If you pay enough attention, you can recognize the patterns, or you can just chalk it up to random happy occurrences that are the byproduct of living in a relatively small city. But is it still just random if you keep running into the same person every time you visit a really large city? And what if those chance encounters don't just happen a few times, but multiple times over the last couple of decades. John Rogers is a Lucy's kid who's been living in New York City for almost 20 years. But New York is a big place, and the chance of running into someone over and over again can't be that high. But we, my husband and I, run into John in New York City a lot. I mean, a lot. Different areas of town, different times of year, different times of the day. Now, based on your belief system, this could mean nothing. It could, like I said, just be random. I choose to believe it means something, although I'm really not exactly sure what. Maybe it's that we're connected in some special past life way, or maybe we're connected by those tiny strings that sometimes pull you in the direction you need to be in for reasons only known to the universe. Or maybe it means something, but we'll never really know what or why. Bob Dylan was the first Bob Dylan Who was billed as the next Woody Guthrie He traveled this land with pen in hand And wrote about what a mess it was in Bob When 14-year-old John Rogers first stepped Bob foot into Lucy's, it was his first live show ever. That performance by the singer-songwriter Wally Pleasant awakened in him a love of live music, and from that moment on, he came to every live show at Lucy's he could get to. When John left Nashville for New York City in 2003, he slowly and sometimes painfully turned his love of live music into his art. He established himself as a preeminent photographer and a documenter of New York City's jazz ecosystem. Decades later, he is an accomplished music photographer, but also an accomplished street photographer, with a new book of his work, Old and New Dreams, that includes an introduction by his mentor and teacher, photographer Dawood Bay. John says that taking pictures of creative people is his life and that everything he learned about photography, he taught himself through friendships. And I hear him say that and I think, maybe there's no reason to spend a lot of time to figure out what random coincidences and chance encounters actually mean. Maybe it's just as simple as learning the lessons you need to learn through your friendships. Let's talk about when you started coming to Lucy's. What what brought you there? Who brought you there, if anyone? Uh, I think the first the first show at concert I ever went to in in life was at Lucy's. I think it was I think it was Wally Pleasant actually. I mean, I went to a lot of shows there. I mean, I started I figured I would just go every Friday and Saturday, and then sometimes during the week. It's just a question of you know, getting, getting my mom to drive me. She wasn't really feeling it a lot of the time or, you know, get a ride with a friend or something. But, and I remember the you and the people there like, Oh, he's back. Again. He's back again. You know, it's just there like all the time. Cause there was, I had never experienced live music before in my life. At that point, I was like a 13 or 14 year old kid. It was my, my exposure to live music, which really led to a whole lot of other 
different roads in my life. But if I hadn't had that foundation, then I don't know that I would have done any of this stuff that I've done later in life. Yeah, yeah. And one of those roads it led you to was to start your own band. Yeah, well, yeah. It, it, well, I had, a, I had a couple bands, but the, the first band that, that played at Lucy's, yeah, that was just sort of a, a direct result of us being there and, and seeing like, hey, it's just regular, you know, local people, like, we can do this too. So um, me and a couple of my friends recorded, you know, quote unquote, an album it was basically just us uh, singing into a Panasonic boombox that had a microphone attachment. And we, you know, we put a lot of work into it. We practiced and and uh, made a made a tape, and and you're like, yeah, let's let's do it. So, <laughs> and that band was called uh, Mother Hubbard. What do you remember about that show? That first show that you had? I remember all the shows. You telling us that we had to stop playing because we were playing too long oh. and too loud, <laughs> too loud and too long. You're like, oh my god, it's too loud. And, and then you're like, all right, it's time to, it's time to stop. Like, you know, so we just had no, we were so hyped up that we didn't have any concept of, of what was going on. But I remember like one show, Dave Cloud opened up for us and, and we'd never seen him before. And then we, we did a show with Low. That was pretty fun. And uh, I wrote Ad, uh, Alan a letter, a fan letter when I was in 10th grade. You know, he wrote me back and we just started corresponding by mail. And then he was basically like, I'm coming back to Nashville. I asked uh, Lucy's if you could open up for me. And then you called me and you were like, do you want to play with Lowe? I was like, yeah, yeah. And you're like, he, he asked for you. I don't know anything about it. I was like, yeah, cool. <laughs> I think you were just kind of like, this doesn't add up like sonically, but he wants to do it. So so we did that show with, with Lowe. And then I had a different band called the Transcendental Crayon Ensemble. And then that band opened for low, same kind of thing. He wrote me a letter. They were playing at the end. And uh, I just showed the guy the letter and was like, all right, we might argue it's a letter from the guy. So we did that show. And that was with the Dirty Three, too. So that was kind of really fun. And then I, I lost touch with Alan for, I, I didn't see him for years after that. And then I was, had just gotten to New York when I was like 23 years old and working at a bakery reading the New York Times one day before work. And I just happened to glance up and this guy walks past me and it's, it's Alan. And I just ran out of the restaurant and chased after him and caught up to him. And I was like, hey, man, you know, John, you remember me? And he's like, yeah, yeah. So he was mixing his album upstairs at a recording studio in the same building and invited me up. And I met the guy who was mastering it, who's a really cool guy, Greg Calby. And we just, you know, we're back in touch at that point. We've been we've been hanging out ever since. And that was like, you know, 20 years ago. So I've, I've known Alan for, you know, since I was 16. He's one of my oldest friends, actually. To Mother Hubbard and the Transcendental Crayon Ensemble, did they differ musically in any way? And what caused the shift from one to the other? So, yeah, Mother Hubbard was like kind of like um, inspired by like the Phantom Five, which was local band, and Manor Astro Man. Those were like kind of, we really wanted to be like a surf rock band but we didn't have a, a drummer. So it was just two guitars and bass. So we did like surf rock with two guitars and bass. And then um, one of the people in the band just went off to college. So then me and the other person in the band sort of started the Transcendental Crayon Ensemble, which was leaning more towards, um, you know, funk and um, avant-garde jazz, which was sort of where we were going, you know, on our sonic journey from surf music you know, surf music was like the springboard to to jazz and avant-garde music for me and for, for other people too. Like Bill Frizzell, for example, told me that surf music was the gateway drug to jazz for him as well. So it wasn't just... And then like also I remember meeting Manor Astro Man in person, you know, down the road from 
Lucy's and telling them about that. And they were like telling me how they, at the time, they were really interested in jazz as well. When they were, you know, on the road or in the van or whatever, that's what they were checking out. So, Do you have any any favorite shows that you remember so from, many, I mean, from Lucy's? You know, Verses we really liked a lot in, in Mother Hubbard from the Half Cock soundtrack. They did a, a song on that called B9 that we really liked. And, you know, I was thinking about, like, the people that I met there that really influenced, like, Leslie Q was really instrumental influence for me when I was you know I met her when I was 13 and she gave me all these mixtapes and introduced me to tons of music that I still listen to today that was on some of those tapes Versus is one of them she was really into Versus so she gave me like you know, three or four albums worth of their stuff you know she turned me on to this band called the, the Heavenly Orchestra of Bali she turned me on to the Clean um, the Clean was doing kind of surf rock kind of stuff a little bit at the time. You know, really, really good stuff. And she was just like a cool role model at the time. Some some other like Lucy's really, and there's there's one memory that I told Kurt, your husband. I I had met him in uh, Odersome in Holland or something. I found out they were playing. I was over in Europe for a while. And they're playing this tiny town in Holland. So it's like, all right, I'm going to go. It took me like, three or four hours to get there by bus. So I got there and I told Kurt this story about how um, when he was playing with Vic Chestnut, I got there, and I think it was like 15 bucks and I didn't have the money and it was it was sold out and I was just like bummed and I was like standing outside. And so Kurt and, and Vic Chestnut come strolling up to the door and uh, I was like, hey, and they're like, you coming in? I was like, yeah, I'm just hanging out here you know, by myself. You know, tried to play it cool, and they were like, "Oh, you know, if you go and uh, get us a couple beers and uh, some cigarettes, you know, we'll we'll get you in." And, and I was like, you know, I was like, "Cool." And I'm like thinking, like, I'm 15 or 16 years old at the time, and I'm like, "How am I going to do this?" So I just walked, walked down the street and uh, went into the store and grabbed a couple 40s and uh, you know, pack of Vantage. And the guy looked at me, had like, I remember he had like a butterfly collar shirt on. And he was like, you're 21, right? I was like, I'm 22. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, no problem. And he sells me all the shit. I was 15 years old. He sells me all the shit. And I, I walked back to Lucy's and got all hand Kurt the beer and the cigarette. And like, thanks, man. Come on in. And he didn't know. I mean, he, he told me later that he's like, I had no idea. I thought you were way older. So sorry to put Kurt on the spot. But it was a funny story. You know, saw Man or Astro Man a few times. That was good. Saw Bikini Kill, that was good. Saw Volvo, Archers of Loaf. I mean, so many good bands that I never would have seen otherwise. I saw Don Caballero. I have so many good shows, and it was just just so lucky to have that. I mean, Lucy saved my life. You know, one hundred percent. If I didn't have that, I don't know. I don't know what would have happened because I was not in a on a good trajectory. That led me to music, and it led me to finding other music and knowing that I can play music and all those things, you know, it mm -hmm. just was really, I'm glad I had that. Yeah. I mean, there were so many, so many good ones. I was, like I said, I was going to everything and actually listening to one of your other podcasts. I realized that I played in this band called Brown Towel as well, which I'd completely forgotten about the existence of Brown Towel. I was, I was, kind of drinking a lot at the time and i don't really remember like 1996 to 2002 super well but I, yeah i played in brown towel i played saxophone well you mentioned running into alan from low and we've run into each other numerous times in new york city so many times so many and like so many weird places too i mean the last time was really weird because i was in a i was in a weird alley and there's not that many alleys in manhattan there's like less than 20 and I'm in this weird alley that I've never been in before and I hear like somebody said John and I was like I thought I thought it was it was you but I thought it was, you were someone else and I was like oh no <laughs> you know and I was like oh god it's Mary cool and, you know <laughs> but it's just like such a random thing but yeah, I kind of agree with you I mean I think that you know my place in the world just sort of you know I just run into people you know or meet people but it's like, you know, just running into you, uh, you guys so randomly. I mean, like Kurt, I ran into him 
I was on a date and I ran into him at a weird bar in Tribeca at like 11 o'clock at night. I'm like, there's Kurt sitting at the bar. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, and then remember the time that Kurt and I were staying at the Ace on Broadway and yep. we rounded the corner and there you were? Then the last time, you know, just like walking through this weird alley. It's like, John? It's yeah. like, and I had on a mask. Like, I don't know how you recognize me. I don't know. I, I think it was just from following you on Instagram and knowing bike camera you know you see the bike and the camera and i was like is it could it be and then i just (laughs) called out your name and it was oh and then remember the time too where was this this was in the west village oh yeah that was with was that you were hanging out with bill frizzell maybe at the time and we ran into you there yeah we just come from dinner and we were going back to the vanguard to so he was going to play and it was just walking down the street you know it's just like i guess you guys like to hang out downtown and i like to hang out downtown so it's not that big of a place you know honestly no no you know what you're right it's not it but it's the timing yeah right it that's what makes this unusual is the that it keep that it keeps happening and that the time we always seem to get the timing right yeah like the time at the ace was like in the evening the thing with kurt in the bar was like 11 o'clock at night like the alley was like two in the afternoon <laughs> right you know just all different times but it just sort of some sort of cosmic thing you know brings us together which is great you know because you're you know you guys are like my heroes so oh. you know if if, if if anybody asked me in an interview besides you like who was your main influences in life you number one gave me music I'll tell that to anybody, you know. Oh, thank you, John. <laughs> no. I'm so glad. Yeah, no. Mary Mancini and Lucy's saved my life and introduced me to live music. And I've told that to other people in interviews. I'll say it right now, you know. Oh, thank you. If I didn't have that, I don't know what I would have done. <laughs> I really don't. It would have not been good. <laughs> I can tell you that much. I was, I was headed towards, like, the jail death path. Man. You know, that so many people in Tennessee that I grew up with ended up on, mm. you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you did. And can I just also, and I appreciate that so much. I I really do. But you also, you have an inner strength and an inner glow that took you from from that. And once you made that discovery, you just, you know, you took it, you found yourself, you found your people. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you had the strength to quit drinking, you know, and... and you know, a lot of that is that it, that comes from within you too. So don't sell and, that you know, short. The, and the stay in New York. I mean, this was really hard. I didn't have any friends for five years. I didn't know anybody. Yeah. I had a very hard time, you know, of like people taking advantage of my like kind of giving open personality. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. that happened a lot. Um, oh, yeah. You know, people stealing from me and like ripping me off and. Mm. all kinds of things you know where other people would have just been like fuck it i'm leaving but i was like i'm gonna stay here because like i'm not gonna let those people beat me you left nashville for new york in 2003 and now almost i remember i I tried leaving before that oh you did what happened I, I, i totally like freaked out and came back and i remember before i moved again in 2003 i ran into you at Springwater, and you were like you sure you want you sure you want to go remember what happened last time it's like yeah yeah cool this time but i wasn't cool i just i just you know something clicked and then it was just like a way to get over the you know the change you know because nashville you get sucked into this sort of like time vortex where like everything's cool ish and um time just goes by really quickly and just you know fall into these grooves you know so it was hard for me to break out of that just like i'm gonna go to bongo Java today and sit there for three hours and not having that in my life all of a sudden was really hard for me to to get used to but after five or so years i started making friends with people <laughs> so it took me that long it's a good thing you stuck with it yeah i feel comfortable now and I'm glad i got out of tennessee for a lot of reasons. I just felt like I I was not gonna accomplish anything in life being in Tennessee, just felt limited by the audience, the size of the audience of what I was putting out there. Their people were cool and like the people that liked my stuff were were nice, but it just wasn't enough people. What stuff were you putting out there at the time? Like the Transcendental Grand Ensemble, um, 
I had, yeah, I had a show at WRBU. I had a show at WFSK. It's just there wasn't an audience for, you know, that kind of music there. And also I wanted to meet all these people that I admired who were, you know, dying slowly. And I was like, if I don't move to New York, I'm never going to get to know these people. And that really bothered me. I really wanted to meet certain musicians and get to know them. And uh, that was a big part of it. have done amazing things since moving to New York. You are now an accomplished music and street photographer. You have a new book of your work that's just come out. It's a gorgeous book. How did the photography start? Did that start when you moved to New York? Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, really just collecting records from like The Great Escape. You know, that was my Saturday thing. I would go to Bongo Java, get, you know, hyped up on coffee and then hit the Great Escape for two or three hours and then uh, go do my radio show at midnight. So in collecting these records, I was looking at the photos and I'm like, I could totally do that. You know, I'm like looking at these photos of all these records and thinking like, I want to do that. I could totally do that. And then just coming here and just going out to shows and just doing it, you know, paying to get into shows and photographing and starting to get noticed by the people working at the spaces like who's this guy showing up every weekend like just taking pictures and then getting to know them then not having to pay to get in and just uh like the jazz gallery uh, there was a guy named dale dale fitzgerald who was the owner and the founder he's, he's since passed away but um and i remember i was there one night and i think i was with a couple friends from nashville that were visiting and he came up to me after the show and he's like you've been here a lot like what's your deal? You know, it's just like, Oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm just a photographer, just practicing, you know, I don't have to come here if it's a problem. And he's like, no, no, no. It's like, so he's like, you just come here and you just want to, you know, practice taking photos and you put musicians. I was like, yeah, totally. That's, that's my whole thing. And he's like, looked me over and he's like, well, it's like, you don't have to pay to get in here anymore. So, so once he did that, then I was just there all the time. And that led me to start photographing musicians and meeting people and, being able to get into other venues for free and, you know, cause I didn't have money to pay cover charges. These places are at the time it was like 30 bucks a night. Now it's like 50. So, you know, I, if I'm not getting in free, then I'm probably, I can't afford it 50 bucks a set. So, you know, taking photos all the time. And then at a certain point started to get noticed by different media people trying to hire me and stuff. So that's sort of how it kind of started. It was just sort of, you know, NPR noticed me posting some of these photos and they hired me based off of the jazz gallery photos. And then that sort of was like the springboard into the music industry working for NPR music. You know, they were like, we're doing these weekly, monthly live broadcasts live from the Village Vanguard or live from the 92 Y. And, you know, we, the, the you know, it's like a live radio broadcast and I'd take pictures and then they'd post them on like a gallery afterwards. And then that led to, you know, being, you know, if you say I work for NPR, then musicians take you more seriously. So I was able to meet more people. And that's how I met Paul Motion and ended up becoming really good friends with him kind of through that meeting. And then I became his assistant. And then he got me hired for ECM Records. And I started shooting a lot for ECM. And once I started shooting for ECM, I started shooting for Blue Note and all these other labels. So after it was all said and done, I think I've shot like 200 albums. Mostly um, like the, and like for ECM, it was like, you know, they'd have some weird abstract photo of like the ocean or something. And then like on the, on the inside, it would be my photos of the, of the session. So like session photos, but you know, I did, a, I did two, two, I did two Blue Note albums. One was a cover for Robert Glasper. I did two albums for Tyshawn Sori last year. One, one has come out already. But, you know, I just have a couple of friends like Tyshawn and a couple of other friends that I 
do steady work for music stuff still, but uh, primarily the last few years I've just been doing this like fine art kind of stuff, street photography, selling to collectors and stuff like that. Mm. And that, and you've, I mean, obviously you're, because you're so established and you're the, you know, preeminent photographer and documenter of New York's downtown avant-garde jazz scene, and you've photographed so many famous musicians, Yusef Latif, Ornette Coleman, Bill Frizzell, so many. Was it hard to gain their trust? I mean, obviously you gained the trust of the people that ran the clubs, but you get right up into the business of these musicians. Was that hard to do, gain their trust so that they they, they let you in? Because your, your portraits and your photography is so intimate with them. Yeah, I mean, um, it wasn't that hard, really. It just was just me being myself and just consistently showing up and being myself every time. And, you know, they saw what I was about over time. I didn't have any agenda. I just wanted to help them out and just wanted to talk about normal stuff. Like, I remember uh, I was photographing this these records for Chick Corea and, and Paul Motion and Eddie Gomez and this, this friend of mine wanted to come and uh, and I brought him to meet those guys and, and he was all like, he brought a couple records with him and he was all like, remember this album and this album and this album. They were polite to him and then after he left, they were like, don't bring that guy back here again. Because they, they were not interested and in, musicians are not interested in talking about what record they did in the past. They want to talk about the present. They want to go out and have a nice meal they want to talk about baseball, you know, they wanted to talk about the Yankees and, you know, let's go get a meal. And, you know, what do you think of this album or that album, not their album, but like other people, or what do you think about this musician or, you know, just normal life stuff, you know, that was, that was the ticket, you know, just, you know, treating people like I'm just your friend and I don't have any agenda. I don't want anything from you. I definitely don't want to talk about, all those records from the past that everyone else wants to talk about. I mean, Paul Motion, I remember I was friends with him for a couple of years and we were having lunch one day and he's like, you know, he's like, you never asked me about Bill Evans. He's like, everybody asked me about Bill Evans. How come you never asked me about it? I was like, cause everybody asks you about it. And I can see that it annoys you. And I don't even really like Bill Evans personally. So that's why I never brought it up. And he's like, all right, well, that's cool. He's like, well, if you ever decide to check out Bill Evans, like here's the albums that I think are really good. <laughs> and um, he's like, yeah, let's just talk about something else. I was like, cool. <laughs> so, I remember Yusef, like, you know, I had just, I got his number from somebody. I was going to interview him on uh, WRVU and I, I got his number from a friend at another station in New Orleans and um, just called him up and, She's like, who are you? And I was just like, I got your number from this guy. And we just started talking. I totally cold called this guy and just started calling him, you know, every, every few days, you know, Hey, it's John from Tennessee. Remember me? Just talk about life, you know? And then, you know, he was like, well, I'm going to be at this thing in New York, you know, are you going to be there? And I would go to this conference and meet him. And then he was like really trying to, you know, he was trying to help me by converting me to Islam. He was really like, inviting me to these Islamic retreats and stuff. And I wasn't really interested in that, but I had a, a mutual friend that I had introduced Yusef to who was interested in that. So he started going to that stuff. You know, he would just be like, I'm coming to New York. You want to come and take some photos? And so I started taking photos of him. And then that was sort of our relationship. But getting back to your point, you know, there was this photo of him in the village Vanguard on, in the kitchen. It's probably still there where I remember we we're all hanging out the Heath brothers were playing and Tootie Heath, the drummer found, finds this photo of, uh, of Yousef. And he's like, who took this photo? And I was like, you know, I, I took it. And you know, the owner and the manager are there and Tootie's like, you know, it's like Yousef really didn't like being photographed and he really didn't like white people, but he loved big John. Uh. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that was, that was cool, man. And it was true, you know, he, he did. And the last time I saw him, I told him I loved him to his face. And he told me he loved me too. So, Aww. you know, I don't know. I was just lucky. I just wanted to be friends with them, you know, because they mm -hmm. meant a lot to me to the point where I just wanted to get to know them because they were part of my life for so long, you know. Do you think they also 
recognized your talent though did you yeah, show them yeah. your photographs yeah no i mean like i mean paul motion you know was like i saw him stop a show while he was playing to go tell someone not to take a photo of him during a show like single people out you know and was nasty to people like really nasty to people about that would ask him for photos like you know he had a <laughs> had a, a weird sense of humor i mean we had a similarly out sense of humor but I saw him say some like harsh, harsh things to people that asked him for photos. But um, I remember like I asked him, I was like, well, you don't, you don't want anybody to photo you at all, but you let me photograph you. And he's like, well, you're an artist. It's different. You know, he was buying my prints too. He's like, I want a print of every band that I bring to the Vanguard. So every week he would play there with a different band. He would hire me to just, he's like, I just want one print, you know? And then now that's all in the fall motion archives and they've made a couple books and, some of the photos are in the books. And, uh... Well, right before, and I guess early on in the pandemic, 2019 to 2020, or in 2019 and 2020, you had your work, talk about fine art, exhibited in both the Walker Art Center, which is in Minneapolis, and then the Whitney Museum in New York. And so much of your work is documenting musical performances and then the pandemic happens, right? So that just stopped for you. No more going out, no more going to shows. What did you do? I just started, well, at first I stayed home for three or four months and I was completely like catatonic because I was always kind of like a germaphobe. So I was just like, if I leave the house, I'm going to die. Like that's where I was at, like in my head, you know? So I just didn't leave the house for, for months and I was able to somehow get through that and then I was just like I gotta go outside <laughs> you know I gotta do something so I was like what do I feel safe doing I was like I feel safe wearing an N95 mask and bicycling and taking photos on the street and eventually after like you know six or seven months of doing that every day I started getting pretty good at good at it and it definitely made me a, a better photographer I think yeah why why do you say that just practicing every day, you know, shooting every single day for a couple of hours, you know, and, and doing stuff that wasn't um, what I'd always done was this, you know, my unique sort of music portraits or post portraits that I had gotten known for doing. I wasn't doing that anymore. All of a sudden I'm doing strangers on the street. I'm not asking them if I can take their photo. I'm just doing it. Most of the time they don't even see me. And I still do that every day. That's that's I did it yesterday. I'm going to do it today. That's that's what I do every single day. Is I just go out, ride my bike for four or five hours, and take photos on the street. And it's just it just made me see more deeply. And it's hard. It's hard to to really maintain that focus on a daily basis. I'm definitely not there yet. So that's something I'm working towards. But what do you mean by maintaining the focus? It seems like you're going out four or five hours a day. Just like really, really seeing seeing deeply into the world you know like my my teacher david bay has a book called seeing deeply and um you know it's really just about seeing beyond the surface of what's in in the world that everybody sees you know and some some days i can do it and i hit i hit it pretty hard and then like other days i do it and it's just not it's not there as good you know i think Daoud, somebody like Daoud can just go out and do it every day. Like I can't do it every day, but I can, I can do it every day, but I can't resonate every day. So that's sort of what I'm working towards. But, you know, through studying with him, you know, primarily really hard during the pandemic. And before that, you know, it's really opened my eyes, you know, in terms of like what I'm capable of doing as an artist. So what does studying with him look like? Um, just, you know, posting some photos. He's like, I like this one. Here's why. And I'm like, well, I really like this one. What do you think about this one? And he's like, ah, oh, it sucks. You know, it's just sort of average, you know, and like that happened a few times where his photos I was really proud of. And, and he was like, yeah, it's just sort of whatever. And I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, and it's like, accept that. And then like, think about why he would say that. And then just to finally just have him tell me, you know, over time, like you're really, hitting on like a high level now you're you're like you started out where you're like pretty okay and now you're like really up there in terms of what you're putting out there yeah does it have to do with 
uh, is there are there processes involved or the mechanics of photography or is is it that in conjunction with just finding a deeper meaning? Are they both something that you have to pay attention to? Yeah, they're both sort of just it's all sort of related, you know, it's like your skill set, you know, your ability to use light and spotlight and spotlight on the street, like what light's going to do what and, and the times of day and the times of year all play factors into the quality of light and the way it changes. And, you know, I spent most of my career indoors in nightclubs. So, you know, I never thought about how the light, the tone of light is different in April than it is in July, you know, cause I was asleep all day. I was never outside in the daytime at all. So I never noticed it, but just really like, you know, I, I took some the other day and, and he liked a couple of them. We talked about them. And I was like, it's sort of like shooting music, except it's just like finding that emotion that someone would have when they're playing music in someone just sitting in a restaurant by themselves or standing on a street corner and just capturing that emotion and uh, just a, your average person doing their normal life stuff and juxtaposing that with some of the music stuff was sort of what I did in the in the in the book. So that's sort of what I'm. You know, when I have a really good day, it's like I get moments of like that of just random people going about their life. But it, it has that sort of resonation and feeling that you would get from similarly from a, a music portrait that I've shot of someone in a nightclub. And you're riding your bike. This is all on your bike. Every day. It's all on the bike. I mean, and I'm riding with a camera around my body, you know, which is like, you know, not a cheap camera. But you have to, you have to wear the camera. I know this, this guy from, from he's a Danish photographer. He's like a YouTube personality. He's a, he's an interesting guy, and he has this concept of called wearing your camera, and he's right. You know, if you don't have it around your body, you're not going to use it. If it's in your bag, you're going to miss so much. If it's in your pocket on your waist, you're going to miss so much because those moments that you see. We were like, that would be dope if I just took that photo, you know. Hey, you have to have, like, the nerve to take the photo and the skills. And you have to do it. And you have to have the camera there to do any one of those things. I don't have the nerves to... There's so much stuff I miss where I'm just like, I don't have the courage to take that photo. I wish I did. But, like, so, some of the really great street photographers just had, like, iron will, you know. Well, what gives you what gives you anxiety about that, or or um, like some, you know, somebody would like attack me or something. You know, New York is is gotten kind of gritty. I mean, like I'm a big dude. You know, I've got a lot of tattoos. Like most people don't fuck with me, but like you just really have to pay attention. Like I mean, yesterday I was like riding along, and there's this red flag guy to me. I recognized him as unstable, like right away. And I'm like watching this guy and he just like these clueless tourists like walk past him, like got way too close to them. And he just flips out and screams at him and they're like, ah, oh. I'm just like, see, you're not paying attention to the city. You know, just always have to, you know, be aware of your surroundings and stuff like that. What do you use? What camera do you use an, uh, for street photography? And is it a different camera than the one you use for your in the club? photography in the club i was using this uh sony camera the most recent one i had was a sony a9 that i was using it wasn't like the greatest camera but it's its benefit was is that it was it was silent it didn't make any noise at all so i can shoot like vocal bass duets and not make any noise and shoot the entire show so that was the benefit of that camera it was a cool camera for what it was but it for the street stuff, it was just really big and bulky. So before the pandemic started, I'd gotten a like a Q, which was like a it's a point and shoot camera, but it's just got a really beautiful lens and and it's it's really one of the most underrated cameras in history, I think, in terms of digital digital cameras. Um, that one was the one that I used the most during the pandemic. I made most of the photos from the book. The street photos were on that camera, and then after. Um, the places, the clubs started reopening and I realized that I wasn't going to be doing the club stuff anymore. I sold all the Sony stuff I had, bought a 
a, a second like a that was for interchangeable lenses and so that i've just been sort of alternating between the q and the and the m which is the other one that i had but it just really you know slows you down they're manual focus cameras they're it's a rangefinder manual focus camera and you have to do all the settings yourself you have to know how the light's going to look and figure it all out and and it doesn't do you any favors but if you input all your settings correctly then you end up with these really beautiful photos the process itself for uh, is it even called developing photos at this point i mean uh, a lot of it you have to do up front you know um if you have like your one setting wrong on one of these cameras it just wrecks your photo for this for the leica stuff just because it's so manual everything you know there's nothing automatic about it with sony you could set it to automatic and press a button and everything's in focus and there's really nothing to it you know you're just basically putting the camera in front of somebody pressing the focus button and it takes care of everything else but the light stuff is not that not that way but the benefit of it is to get these amazing lenses that are like you know a tenth of the size of uh, any other brand lens and you just get these crazy results and for someone who's riding a bicycle it's just a way to travel you know with you know, high quality results at a, at a lightweight package for someone that's got a camera strapped around their body. I've only had one, one problem where I was like attacked from somebody in the last three years. The guy got me from behind um, while I was biking. Was this after you had taken a picture of him or this was just random? No, I was just, just random. I think he thought I was Asian because I had on a mask and I was in an Asian neighborhood and this was when there was a lot of Asian hate crimes going on. So I think he just assumed that I was an Asian person. And then when I was on the ground and he saw that I wasn't Asian, he backed away and, and left. Super weird. But uh, Awful. I, just, I just got a little dent on the bottom of the of the queue and it, I got up and it still worked. And I was like, it's, it works. I'm not injured. Like, I consider that a win. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> Talk about the book a little bit and your process for putting that together. How did that come about? Um, it was basically just like I had a really bad experience last summer, like the summer of uh, 2021, I guess. And it was just like shitty, really shitty moment and like major life shift and related to the pandemic and just decided that um, I re- I'd always wanted to make a book and I figured like now is the back then was like the perfect time. So I went to, to, um, Dawood and I was told him I wanted to make a book and he said that he would, uh, write, you know, if, 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 if he liked it, he would, um, write the introduction for it. And he turned me on to this. He suggested that I make the book with, um, this guy, Daniel Ramos, who was an, another one of his students. And so Daniel was living in Brooklyn at the time and Daniel and his wife basically just, um, sort of made the book for me in a lot of ways. I just was like, here's all the photos that I'm willing to entertain for this book. And I gave him all the photos and they came out with the, came up with the design. And, you know, I'm kind of like, you know, a very critical argumentative person at times. So he was like, well, I don't want to do it if you're going to like argue with me. And I'm like, I promise I won't say anything. I won't argue at all. You're, you're the DJ, <laughs> you do it. And, uh, and he came up with a design and I said, I, I love it. And that was it. And you had a, a book signing recently. How did that go? Yeah, that was cool. You know, it's just it was it was something that Dawood had been encouraging me to do. He's like, you got to do it, at least like one of these. It was at Public Access Gallery, which is run by this actor Leo Fitzpatrick, who was in the movie Kids, and he was in that show The Wire. It's just kind of interesting, you know. Like Kids was like this movie that I remember seeing at the Bell Court in Nashville, and I was like that's how it is in New York. Like, <laughs> shit, I want to get to New York, man. Like, you know, so now like, you know, 30 years later, I'm sitting here like with my work hanging in this guy's art gallery. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I remember I was talking to Leo before the show when we were talking about Nashville a little bit. And I was like, you know, Harmony Corrine grew up in Nashville. And I was saying like his, his dad owned this skateboarding shop called Shooting Stars on West End. And Leo was like, he's like, that that was real? He's like, I thought that was just a rumor. 
And it's like, <laughs> no, that was a real place, you know? And it was like this hip store. That was a, like in the late 80s or early 90s. And uh, it was like very skateboard centric. So. Do you, out of all the photos that you've taken, and this is probably an unfair question, but I'm asking it anyway, do you have a favorite? No, I mean, I don't really believe in favorites. Um, I like everything valid, equally validly. Um, I don't have like, you know, there have like a few favorite people, I guess, but um, yeah, I don't know. I like them all. They're all, they all, I remember all of them. I remember like how it felt. You know, when I took them, like, you know, each each one is like, you know, that was a whole day or a whole week, like leading up to that moment in some cases, you know, or just, you know, putting it on the calendar. Like that was a big deal to be there that day or it was a record or something or a, a concert that I was looking forward to and getting to the concert and everything in life, like leading up to that moment, you know, and then waiting for that to see the moment that I captured, you know, or just watch shows with a camera in front of my face the entire, you know, two hours, I'd be sitting there like this, mm -hmm. the entire show waiting for that moment, you know, and, you know, I didn't care about anything other than getting that moment. That was the most important thing to me for that day, you know? Yeah. So yeah. a lot of it's like that, you know, and just, you know, all the, the life, you know, the bad experiences, <laughs> mostly bad that like led up to that point, you know, just like persevering through all the bullshit to like get to this moment where I'm in front of this person who I really like and I, I have a chance to document them or like, you know, I'm in my early to mid twenties and like everybody's out partying and going to bars and doing all that shit. And I'm in a jazz club with a bunch of old, old people like with a camera in front of my face all night. That's what I wanted to do, you know? Yeah, and you have a tremendous body of work to that el that illustrates that. Yeah, it's all these other people don't don't have that. So you yeah, know, absolutely. <laughs> and still, I mean, you know, two thousand twenty or two thousand twenty one was like the most fucked up year of my life, and I still was like, I'm just gonna go out every day and just keep doing it because there's nothing else to do. Like my coping mechanism is taking photos on the street and that's also my job <laughs> and riding a bike those are my two coping mechanisms so yeah. if i don't do that i'm just going to get really depressed and you know not it's not a good good thing so i just need to go out every day and work and and try to make some good work and hopefully that'll keep the ball rolling Thank you so much for listening. For more info about John and to see more of his work and his book, go to johnrogersnyc.com. If you have any stories, pictures, or music you want to share about the Lucy's Days, go ahead and send them to me at Lucy's Record Shop on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Or you can email me directly at mary at lucysrecordshop.com. Many thanks to Michael Eads for his time and for the use of his studio. Thanks to Lamb Chop for the intro music. And links to full versions of the songs used in this episode can be found in the episode notes and at lucysrecordshop.com. This show is part of We Own This Town, a podcast network of original entertainment and documentary content. You can find more info at their official site at weownthistown.net or follow along at We Own This Town on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time. Thank you.